your trusted source for information on the energy transition. This is the Insider's Guide to Energy podcast. Welcome to another edition of the Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm Chris Sass, your host. This week's episode is focused on software and the software to run a modern grid and to put the foundation in place for what's to come. As we go through this energy transition, there's a lot of demands and changes taking place on the grid every day. We all know about distributed energy resources. We probably already know about electrification of everything and EVs, but Mahesh is gonna walk through how that impacts the grid and why that's important. There's been a trend in the past to focus on the IT side and get the data clean from IT to take that out, use AI and do other interesting things with it. But there seems to have been a lack on focus on OT information. And this is where Mahesh is gonna accelerate the curve and talk about what GE is doing to enable our utilities to do more with the infrastructure they have today and to make smarter decisions to cope with the ever-evolving grid of the future. Mahesh, the, the grid has changed quite a bit in recent years, and it's developed into distributed energy resources and things like that. Can you help me understand what some of the challenges are of this evolution? Absolutely. Right? When, when you look at the electric grid, almost all dimensions of the electric grid is changing. The topology of the grid is changing. So if you look at transmission, distribution, and edge networks, now the broad definition of each of these things are changing because distribution networks are now starting to behave like transmission networks. Transmission networks are starting to behave like distribution networks. So this needs a foundational change in how we manage the electric network. We commonly talk about the grid going from unidirectional to bidirectional. Uh, but but now it is going to omnidirectional or multidirectional, right? And that requires an absolutely new paradigm on how you manage the grid. This paradigm requires software because when you have complexity in any system, you need software to help manage this at scale. And we are seeing uh, for the first time a lot more software, data, and AI get into operational systems. And I think I think that is going to fundamentally change how the management or orchestration of the grid is done. And you talked about the different levels, you're talking about different directions. How do things like EVs and electrification of just about everything play into this? See, electrification uh, of everything, starting from um, what we talk about, residential heating and, and EVs is something that is more common, but electrification as a trend is going to be a lot more pervasive and it's going to start getting into industrial heat and high, high heat over a period of time. But electrification is extremely essential for us uh, as, as the world, especially if electrification is fed with uh, carbon-free um, uh, sources, it gets the world to sustainability faster. So it's an important mega trend. But electrification also brings new challenges, right? Because uh, the electric networks today were uh, sized for a particular volume. Uh, now with electrification, the, the, the number of devices, even at, at our, own, our own homes, the number of devices that consume electricity is going up. Right, and uh, if you look at just the substation outside or the poles and breakers outside, they were not designed for that kind of electric uh, load. Now, the answer to every question could be, let's put in more uh, wires and cables uh, or put in more big iron. Yes, that could be a longer term solution because that has to be done over a period of time. But to, on the shorter term, there's an opportunity to manage uh, some of these with software because software helps you optimize a network and use it at full scale. So there's an option to use software to start doing this dynamic load balancing or reingestion. Uh, and that is something that I'm a lot more excited about. All right. So you're saying that dynamic load balancing, we've been balancing networks for quite some time. That's not a new concept. What's new about the way we're doing it with software today that we didn't do, let's say, 10 years ago? It is the sheer size, veracity, and volume. Right. If you look at that in the past, uh, in the past, you the systems are a lot more deterministic, right? Uh, uh, and the loads that you used to deal with uh, were a lot more understood, and the variations were always within finite bounds, right? So now what is happening is both on the on the transmission distribution side, you let uh, the road, loads are becoming probabilistic. If you look at if you look at a generation source like wind or solar, it is driven by climatic conditions, right? The big determinant is weather. And weather changes, and that has to become that is starting to become an input criteria uh, into some of these systems. Similarly, if you look at EVs, now EVs are the classic dynamic uh, mobile load, 
right? So, and how an EV injects and where does an EV inject at different parts of the day, especially as a fleet, uh, are very different problems. Now, these problems need an understanding and also an ability to forecast and simulate what is going to happen. And then based on the forecasting and simulation, you can start planning. And all of this is underpinned with software today. And, and software is going to get more and more embedded in these processes going forward. All right. So I understand a fleet concept with EVs or, or light vehicles like trucks. Uh, and the impact, and you could plan around that. But if you if you started in your opening statement saying that we're oversubscribing, everything's getting electrified, your home has a lot more uh, use, you said you, you could fix it with bigger pipes, but you basically aren't doing that today just because of the overhead and the time to get there. How is the software getting more out of the existing infrastructure? Multiple examples, right, uh, Chris? Let's, let, let's take an example that's, that's very easier to understand. The, uh, if you look at the classic transmission network, transmission networks are loaded and rated for a particular capacity. Now, with something called dynamic line rating or DLR, uh, which is a, which is in the industry terminology is called non-wired alternative. We can apply a non-wired alternative that is AKA applying software. You can dynamically change the rating of a line based on the weather condition it's in. In certain weather condition, you can actually uh, to your plumb, your example of pipes, you can push more in the pipe. And certain uh, certain cases, you can't, right? And this is a combination of both temperature and wind conditions. We can model that today. So we can actually use the existing network and do more uh, with the limited capacity we have. And that is a very good example of not necessarily putting more hardware into the ground, but using software to do this at scale. Similarly, I would give an example of electric vehicles. When do you charge an electric? You would, your objective is to charge an electric vehicle at the right cost. Now, when do you charge it can be something that software can help determine. And that is another example of using software combined with the, the physics of the network to decide what the optimum charge point is. And that can delineate and also alleviate uh, some of the challenges a network faces. Now, imagine doing this at scale. That unlocks a lot of value. Well, scale comes up at one angle. The other thing I think of is you have transmission networks, you have distribution networks, you have, seems like multiple players. How do they talk to each other and do this across end to end, right? If you're going to make a forecast across end to end all the way down to a user or a fleet or a commercial user, how does that work? So I think, Chris, this is, this is still early stage right now, because if you look at transmission networks, distribution networks, and the classic DERMs or edge-based networks, they're fundamentally three different silos in, a, in an electric network. And based on geographies and countries, there's so many variations of this. But one thing is something we as GE believe in is you have to have visibility across transmission, distribution, and edge to actually run the network of the future. And we call it orchestrating across TV and dumps. But what do you mean by orchestration? What you're orchestrating is the data and the situational awareness across all of these networks to optimize the best answer, right? So interoperability and data is what becomes extremely critical. Just like with anything that you would see, the more information and more visibility you have a, of a particular challenge, the better decisions you can take. And running electric network is only getting more challenging. So more visibility and more data you have, you will, it'll lead to better insights and better decisions. Let's talk about the data, because data means so many different things to so many different people. When you're saying more data, what specific kind of data are we talking about and how do we get it into a format that we can use it and make it actionable? Absolutely, right? So if you look at data, primarily when, when a utility used to talk about data, I would define the data into IT data and OT data. A lot of the modernization discussion that has happened in the utilities over the past, say, a decade or so has been on the IT side. It's about smart metering data. It is about billing data and all with the purpose of understanding the customer better. Right, and, and, and there were some good outcomes achieved from that. But what was left out was OT data. OT data is the data from all the operational systems that actually run the electric grid. So the, uh, the, the, the systems like an ADMS, an, an, an EMS, which runs the transmission network, and also a DERM solution, which manages distribution. This data was left out of the equation because this data, which is real time, was more difficult to access. Now, Unless you marry IT data and OT data together, you're not going to lead to actionable insights that are required to solve these problems. So one of the things that we as GE have done is 
taken our experience of the physics of the network through our applications that we understand pretty well, and we do that for a large amount of customers, marrying that with an acquisition that we did called Greenbird, who are, who are, who are specialists in data, bringing those two ex, uh, expertise together, and we launched a capability called GridOS Connect. So this capability helps expose OT and IT data in a, in a structured manner that is actually usable. Now, now we can actually unlock this data to drive many use cases, and, and we could talk more about that. All right, so the name Grid OS implies it's an operating system for the entire grid. Is that what the, the name should be implying? That is our ambition. Over a period of time, so Grid OS is, is the capability set that we have launched in the market uh, last year, which is our attempt to have a common oper operating system fabric uh, across transmission distribution at the edge. And we build the operational capability today. Our idea is to do this at scale. Or um, we, what we are trying to do here is over a period of time, add additional capability to this portfolio to ensure we solve this problem of grid modernization at scale. And GridOS Connect is just an extension of what we have been doing over the past two years. And then when you have this data with so many different stakeholders, are there concerns about who owns the data and who can see the data? Is that one of the reasons this hasn't happened already? The, yes, because, I, because at the end of the day, this is, a, this is the data that is the operational data to run a network. So this is, uh, this is the most important data for a utility. So one of the things that, of course, is this has to be done in a federated manner. There are dimensions of cybersecurity that are extremely important. Because at the end of the day, these are the systems that run the electric grid. So managing cybersecurity is important. And what is the posture you're going to have for cybersecurity? We at GE believe in, in the concept of zero trust which means every, every interaction in a network has to be done in a way where it's encrypted. And not only that, every interaction needs to be verified. So that is our ethos on how we look at uh, data around the OT dimension. Having said that, this is a data that the utility owns and it is not owned by us. It is owned by the utility. We help expose this data for a utility or, or a provider to develop additional applications on top. Uh, so that is, that is something that is very clear from our operating model. Okay, so I'll, I'll take at face value the security aspect that you just described. Uh, I take the data, but when I have this data, in a modern world, I, I don't think I can read anything about technology and not hear about AI today. So is AI a part of the solution then? Is, are we taking this data and, and doing something with the data now? Yeah, uh, Chris, you bring up a very important point. There are a lot of folks who talk about AI, uh, and, and AI is very thematic um, as we're having this conversation. I want to first start by opening by saying you cannot do AI, any kind of AI, without data, right? And you cannot do utility AI without OT data. It's, it's only now with the capability that we're bringing to market that we can expose this data. Now, an AI system is as good as the data it's trained on. So this is going to be the attempt at applying AI on the OT domain. I would give you an example, like something that we all can understand, EV charging. I, if we have to charge an EV with sustainable energy uh, at the right price point, it is a combination of a forecasting problem, it's a scheduling problem, it's a price problem, it's also a market and trading problem. Now, all of these different capabilities need to come together. Each of these capabilities are models that need to interact with each other. And that, at its very basic, is, is how we're going to start applying AI uh, in the utility domain. So from a leadership in the organization, those are separate silos. Uh, those are just different work functions or tracks. So how do you get the stakeholders across to, to have one tool to do all those things you just described? Because those aren't necessarily the same responsibility by the same individual as you described it. Absolutely, right? So one of the things that you actually look at in, in, as you're going into this world, uh, interoperab interoperability matters. Interoperability across transmission distribution uh, and on the edge would matter. It is not, not in all cases today, but if, if you are able to draw a line into the future, you'll start seeing that these are all going to be systems that need to talk to each other. Utility per se in the past, these systems were campus systems, as in these are systems that only were required to run a particular operations. That error is soon uh, limited because as we get onto the, like, for, for use cases on the distribution side, you need to have awareness on what's happening in transmission. 
if you for use cases on the distribution side, you need to understand how your virtual power plants are operating and how they are getting uh, sized. So all of these th become interdependent problems. And if you look at that, the core, uh, there's some work to be done at what is the operating model uh, of uh, utilities in the future? At what, uh, what dimensions do we start exchanging data? Where do we share data? Or who owns the data? And end of the day, what use cases can you drive? I believe that as you look at energy transition, uh, this is not just about having one player. It's not just GE or it's not just somebody else. It is about having the right set of stakeholders coming together to build a solution. Right? And I, I would say this is, this is team sport at scale. Now, is there value if in incrementally people coming on board? Because maybe not all the utilities are at the same place. So my experience in doing energy is no two companies are the same digital maturity. They're all at different points on that journey. So how do we bring utilities on to this interconnectivity and operational you know, ability if only some of them are ready today? Uh, Chris, this is something that some, somebody very wise told me when I started my career in utilities, right? I see they told me utility business is, is, the, is, is all about uh, being first to be second, right? So uh, everybody wants to be a fast follower and not the first person, right? Having said that, there are some leading utilities that are trailblazing here. Because for the first time in many years, right, some of these problems cannot be specified in an RFP or a requirement. This is a place where a lot of co-creation needs to happen because the solutions are not well understood. So this is a place where some of the leading utilities in the world are actually working with us to start building the solutions. But there are also as many fast followers who are coming and uh, taking some of these solutions earlier. This is a place wherein... Uh, all utilities need to like come along because if you look at phenomena like weather and climate, it does not differentiate between a leading utility and a following utility. It affects everybody equally, right? So this is an opportunity for all utilities to take lead. But again, with applying technology and capabilities, right, it has to be done in a very balanced manner. At the end of the day, uh, technology is about delivering value in a safe, affordable, reliable manner. It is not just technology for technology's sake. And what makes the timing of today, what, what makes a CEO or one of the C-suite of one of these utilities wake up and say, today's the day we start this project? Why, why now? It is, it is because uh, of what our, the utility CEOs are seeing, right? So if you look at uh, one example is climate and weather, it is it's only getting more adverse. The number of weather phenomena that's unpredictable coming in every year, uh, it is at an all-time high. One, cyber security. And so this is end of the day, it's critical national infrastructure. Cybersecurity challenges are at an all-time high. Not other than that, if you look at the, the, the data tsunami that is happening at every single OT system and also even the IT system, is at an all-time high. And again, this, this for the first time in many, in many years, uh, the electric network is so critical for electrification, right? So these are, these are fundamental forces that are actually converging at, at one time now. So this is an opportunity to like take action because the utilities that are going to take action at this stage are going to be the utilities that are going to be in the future as leaders. So as utility CEOs, this is an opportunity to take that leadership. I heard you say earlier in the interview that part of the reason you do this is you can get more, you, more capacity out of the existing infrastructure. And I've also heard you talk about operational so is this an operational savings or a CapEx savings if I go down this path? See, end of the day, if you look at end of the day, data unlocks a lot of value, right? So, and, the, and, and the example I gave you is dynamic line rating. So dynamic line rating helps you avoid putting new uh, big iron or big copper as you, as, you, as you look at it on the ground, right? So it definitely helps you with CapEx savings. It also helps you with OPEX savings because end of the day, uh, you're operating the grid uh, at, at a similar volume as today. Right, so, so the savings happen across both dimensions. What is more important is, is value. You are getting value today versus value after say five years, where after doing a large infrastructure project. So for me, the, when I look at this, this is a value conversation. Software is the fastest path for you to get to value. And I think the non-wired alternatives as it's called now, uh, is, is one approach to look at this problem again, this is not the only solution. This is part of a toolkit uh, that a utility needs to apply. Are there standards that need to be worried about right now to make this work universally, or are there standards already in place that, that you are 
using or are you becoming the de facto standard by doing this? This is something that I think the, the one thing uh, I'm, I'm so proud about the utility industry is one of the most collaborative industries in the world. So this is something that is being built with our customers. In, in the utility domain, you don't, you don't get innovation on its own. All innovation is built with customers. So again, standard bodies matter. A lot of these are based on open standards, which are adopted from other industries. So these are not net new capabilities or standards that we are creating. We are adopting standards that come from other industries, right? And also there's a, there's a lot of work that's happening with uh, the standard bodies, including IEEE. There's a lot of work that's happening with the research labs. Uh, well, this is something that I'm very uh, heartened by what the, how this industry operates. It's, it's collaboration, it's team sport. Help me understand the roadmap of what we're talking about today. We, we talked about data. Let's, let's, let's maybe spend a little bit more time on the technology of what you're doing and go through the phases of, of how you envision this rolling out through a utility. So the way I, I would, let's look at it from, uh, let me give you the, 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 the highest level view, right? So at the end of the day, uh, our, our ambition as, as G Vernova and, and, as, uh, and within that grid software, we believe that the grids into the future will have a lot of autonomous operations. There's going to be a lot of AI that is, that's going to be involved in running and managing a grid. So an autonomous grid is where the end state would be. Now, is the end state going to happen over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? That is, that's welcome a debate because this has to go through a lot of operational challenges to get there. What is happening today? Today, I think the value is interoperability across transmission, distribution, and edge systems. Now, with the capability that we are bringing to market, we have made this a reality. Now, now we can have transmission systems talking to distribution systems, talking to edge. So the topics around situational awareness, forecasting, simulation, which are core building blocks for any operational systems, they are getting more and more high fidelity. And over a period of time, we want these building blocks to become, uh, first thing, more, more generally available and in almost all systems. So there's some standardization happening there. But again, as I laid out, into the future, the idea is to have more and more of these decision-making being done in an autonom autonomous manner for a, for a plain reason that you need software and, and also AI to take these complex decisions because they, they go beyond the capability of a human operator to, to manage given the sheer scale and volume. So that is the future that we envisage in that. And we are working very hard with our utility partners to build capabilities to get there. Are we at the point today where it is too much data and, and the speed that you need to make decisions is too much for a human already at today's environment? It is already uh, getting there. Now, if you imagine a scenario wherein you have a large solar plant in your service territory and the weather is changing, now these are becoming large distributed loads. Imagine you have a fleet of EVs that need to be charged at a particular substation. It's a challenge. Imagine you have a major weather event coming into your geography, which is unlike any weather event that you've seen in the past 10 years. These are all situations that are happening today. So because of this reason, uh, the industry is recognizing that we need to apply software more pervasively to be in a position to react faster and also to react effectively. Uh, so I see this happening today, but I believe that over a period of time, uh, this will this will lead to uh, this is going to become a, a standard operating model. Now, at the rate that the the data is doubling and growing, with at the rate we're going in the utility industry, um, do you see a point where we're going to have trouble storing and, and, and keeping this much information? Because we for a long time we just said keep it because disk is cheap, but we're we're growing data at data at quite a rate these days. So the thing is, I, I would approach it slightly differently, right? So, so data is not always a storage problem. Data is an insight problem. Uh, with technologies that are today, you are able to take the data and convert in the insight you require. So the footprint of the data you use is different. And the way you store data has gone through phenomenal changes from a technology breakthrough of the past decade, right? So so this is becoming, uh, it, it is a challenge, but I, would, I wouldn't put it in, the, in, in my list of the top three. Uh, storing data, I think there are more intelligent ways to handle this problem today. All right. And then let's change gears a little bit, talk a little bit about GE and your software strategy, a little bit of where you are as an organization and where you plan to go. Absolutely. Uh, so Chris, uh, we are becoming GE Vernova in a week. And, uh, and GE Vernova is a purpose-built company for electrification and decarbonization. 
Uh, so the entire company is focused on serving uh, this particular customer, that is the utility, right? And our ambition is to is to earn our right to be a provider of choice uh, for operational systems, uh, especially the software for operational systems. We today have the privilege of supporting 40% of the world's transmission utilities and 30% of the world's distribution utilities. And we are a leading provider of terms in the world. So it's a, it's a very privileged position that we have. What we're trying to do, uh, working with our utility partners and also uh, our industry partners, is to create a new paradigm wherein we are able to create interoperable systems across transmission distribution and terms. So Grid OS, the, the, the technology capability we spoke about, is our attempt in that direction. So this is getting a lot of traction. And uh, one of our ambitions is to build this capability and make it the most robust portfolio to support grid modernization. And we are very excited about what we can do here. So if you had a crystal ball today, what is the killer app that comes next for this? So if you get grid OS to where you want it to be, you have the interoperability, what's the killer app that can bring value to the utilities? So Chris, this is a place where I would, I would borrow from my technology peers, right? So I think the real killer app is having a co-pilot for the operator. So uh, a technology co-pilot that works with the operator, uh, works in tandem with the operator to help the operator make, make decisions. Because we fundamentally believe that it's not, we cannot run a grid without the operator. What we can do is we can augment an operator to take better decisions faster. So the co-pilot uh, for a grid operator is something that I think is going to be a killer app, which is going to be something that's going to differentiate how a utility operates. And also it's going to be a massive support for all the grid operators because it can take some of the mundane tasks away and help the operator focus on the most important capabilities. And this also will address some of the skill challenges we have, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a workforce that is retiring and we have to get uh, new folks into this industry, right? So I think a grid co-pilot is something I'm absolutely excited about. Okay, so just to make sure I understood our conversation today, we, we started out talking about the value of getting the data out of these operational networks and being able to do something with it or apply AI with it and having good, gar good, good data in to get good data out. That was one of the values that you get immediately. The second value that I heard you say is you can do more as there's more demand on the limited resources it's something you can get immediate impact and manage your resources better get more out of it and if we turn the clock ahead the future gets to if we've done all these things well we've put the foundation in place to get a co-pilot to help me make better decisions for my operation is that pretty much summarizing today's conversation if you absolutely said it right i well, I want to thank you for sharing the story today and what GE is up to. This is exciting stuff. Uh, look forward to seeing what happens over the next week and seeing your peers as they all come out with the, the new organization and keep going forward. Thank you so much for joining us in Insider's Guide to Energy. Chris, absolutely a pleasure. Thank you for having me. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you want to find out more, add comments, ask in the questions in the YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe and like the content if you like this kind of content. We'll see you again next time on the Insider's Guide to Energy podcast. Bye-bye for now.